So I was asked to um, put together um, some, you know, a recent review of some of the things that we're doing in our laboratory and, and how do they relate with um, the whole topic that we're discussing here today. So I'm going to briefly mention some of the things that we've been doing in the laboratory and how um, changes, um, most of the changes that we're looking at are actually molecular, uh, the, uh, the DNA sequence, but we're also looking at some methylation changes as well. So we'll talk about three main things. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, epidemiology of colorectal cancer in Puerto Rico. And then we're going to talk a bit about some of the pathological changes that occur in the population, uh, both in Puerto Rico and also Hispanics from the U.S. And then we're going to finalize with a new field that we're actually, I mean, it's not a new field, but a new field for us, in which we're looking at genomic admixture um, and colorectal cancer risk, whether or not coming from, you know, um, having genes that are more African or more Amerindian or more Caucasian increases your risk, your own risk of developing cancer. Uh, so just to put this in perspective, um, this is data from Puerto Rico, the, can, the uh, Puerto Rico Central Cancer Registry, and you can see that the second most common cause of cancer in the Puerto Rican males, it's actually colorectal cancer. For women, it's also the second most common cause of cancer, followed, uh, following breast cancer. And when you look at the distribution of colon cancer in the island of Puerto Rico, you can see that there are some patterns that immediately come to your mind, and you can see that there is a predominance of um, new cases in the, in the um, coast. And of course, you can argue where are the, the centers that um, people go to get the diagnosis. And, um, but you know, it immediately gives you some idea of um, heterogeneity of the disease. Uh, this data was published um, uh, last year. Um, um, the lead author is actually here, Marie Belize, somewhere. And we actually helped her. And um, this was a fantastic uh, presentation that showed patterns of incidence and mortality of colorectal cancer. So just to put this in perspective, on this side, we have the incidence, and this graph, we have the mortality. And um, she was comparing three main groups. So she was looking at USA, uh, she was looking at US Hispanics, and also as Puerto Rican Hispanic. And, and that's in blue right here. And you can start here in 1992 all the way to 2001. So in the graph on the left side, uh, when you look at the incidence of colorectal cancer in Puerto Rico, you see that the graph, you know, the slope is actually going up. And that's called the annual percentile change for those EP people that are here. That was 2.12 in among Puerto Rican Hispanics compared to a negative number uh, among the U.S. population. Or if you look at the U.S. Hispanic, that was also um, in a positive but a small number. So the incidence uh, of colorectal cancer among Puerto Ricans uh, is actually going up. Similar scenario for the mortality. And you can see again that the um, mortality or uh, the annual percentile change for mortality among Puerto Ricans was higher and positive was 1.2 versus a negative um, 1.74 among the U.S. So the trends are actually going up. And when you do the same thing um, and you do it by gender, you can see similar patterns again. For women, the annual percentile change for mortality, I'm sorry, for incidence is higher and you can see the same thing for men. So that, that brings the whole concept of, of variations in incidence and mortality according to both gender and ethnicity as well as race. And, you know, I'm a gastroenterologist, as I mentioned at the beginning, so what I do colonoscopies, and, you know, if it weren't because we know that colon cancer develops after a series of years, and as Sandy was mentioning, the cell starts with one mutation, but it accumulates many, many different mutations or egg mutations that at the end gives the cell the advantage to become a tumor or, or even metastasized. Because of that length, which is about 10 to 15 years, that's why we do colonoscopies, so that we can find that Precursor in this case is called a polyp. We take it out and we stop the career process of cancer. So that's very mechanic, but it's based actually on the model, on the biological model that tells us that it takes 15, 10, 15 years from a normal cell to become a tumor. So if we have a technique that allows us to um, intervene in this pathway, in this molecular pathway, you wonder, you know, why people are not actually using this um, particular um, technique. So this is data that comes from the CDC, and they actually, you know, they asked people whether or not they had a colonoscopy or a sigmoidoscopy in the previous five years, and you can see that the use of um, screening endoscopy is about 60% among um, U.S. Um, whites. When you look at African Americans, it's about 54, but then look at the data from Puerto Rican and Hispanics. It's much lower. It's almost half the number of people that are in Puerto Rico undergoing screening tests. So that brings the whole field of, you know, not the molecular per, per se, but rather, you know, access to care, maybe education. There are many, many things. And maybe that explains why the annual percentile change that I mentioned at the beginning, the incidence and the mortality is actually going up in Puerto Rico rather than going down. But then um, we're also molecular biologists here. So maybe this is important. Maybe, and of course, I, we know it's important. But maybe 
the tumor itself, the molecular biology of the Hispanics, uh, it's different. And that's one of the next set of um, slides that I'm going to show you. So we actually, I worked together uh, with um, Wilfredo de Jesus, who's, uh, he was um, completing his master with us, and we performed a study, it was a, a, a small study, we evaluated 164 tumors from patients from Puerto Rico that had colon cancer, and we looked at absence of a protein that is called the mismatch repair protein. This is a protein, um, this is a gene that produces a protein that is important to keep the, the fidelity of the DNA during replication. So when there is a problem in the base, a mismatch, um, the complex, which is a couple of proteins, goes there, correct that, and fixes them. Then from now on, the problem is uh, taken care of. And we know that when there is absence of the protein, because of the, uh, there is mutation in the gene or a methylation on one of the genes, the phenotype is going to be different. So to make the long story short, we look at how many of our patients now uh, that had colon cancer had absence of that protein. And when you combine, combine the two most common proteins, which are the MLH1 and the MSH2, we, we found that about 4% of all our samples, of our patients in this case, had absence of the protein. And it's lower, much lower than what has been published in the U.S. for population-based studies. In the U.S., about 10%. So it's about half of the, of, of the percentage or the prevalence. And then we also look at the location of this tumor, the phenotype. And we found that most individuals that had absence of the protein have the, the tumor on the right side of the colon, which tells you that if a patient is undergoing a sigmoidoscopy where only the left side of the colon is being evaluated, then we could be missing the right side lesions. Uh, this has been um, seen in other groups. And then we also look at the type of differentiation, and we also notice that uh, most um, individuals that had absence of the protein, again, because of the gene was mutated or methylated, they had um, highly differentiated tumors. We look at um, the association between absence of this protein and the risk of, um, of dying, and we couldn't find any association. Uh, the only association was between stage of the tumor, so if you have a tumor that is at advanced stage, your five-year survival is going to be you know, lower than those that have advanced disease. But that's all known knowledge. So we decided that in addition to evaluating our patients from Puerto Rico, we wanted to evaluate individuals that were also classified as Hispanics, were from the U.S. And you know, Hispanics is a very, you know, fluent and wild, uh, open term, right? In the U.S., a Hispanic is someone that speaks Spanish, regardless of whether or not you were born in Spain. And if you are really from Spain, you know that your genomic, um, your genes are actually Caucasian. So by definition, Hispanics are just an heterogeneous group of, patients, well, of people. And because of that, you would imagine that the tumor may also be very different. So Hispanics from Argentina, might have a very different tumor when you compare to Hispanics from Mexico or when you compare to, to you know, Hispanics from Cuba. Why? Because the genomic background is different. And that's a hypothesis, right? Because not many people have been looking into that. In fact, if you look and you do a Google, well, now it's Google or PubMed, rather, um, search, uh, and you look, but if you do it on Google, you'll find it too, actually. It's even better. Uh, you go to PubMed and you look at, you know, colorectal um, cancer, um, different genomic admixture, you will find very, very few studies um, looking into that. So we partner with the Colon Cancer Family Registries, which are a group of, um, it is a huge group of uh, um, uh, registries. Um, that they, they have over 10,000 different cases of colorectal cancer, and they have evaluated the tumor. So they've done mismatch repair proteins, they've done microsatellite instability, they look at some other genes, and we asked them to um, let us evaluate the group of Hispanics among those 10,000 people that they have already recruited in over a period of 10 years. So interestingly, they only had 177 Hispanic patients out of those 10,000. So you can see, again, this is like the largest um, um, registry, and just a small fraction of the group were actually Hispanic. And you know, we evaluated those individuals, those are just the um, clinical characteristics. And we look again at um, the, the uh, molecular um, changes, right? So we look at microsatellite instability and we look at um, mismatch repair status in, on those um, 177. And we saw that if you look at MSI, 29% of those people that, had, that were classified as Hispanic had microsatellite unstable tumors compared um, to, you know, 71%. And then we look at mismatch uh, repair and the absence of the protein, and here it's 20%. If you recall, the study that I, we mentioned before in Puerto Rico, it was only 4%. So in Puerto Rican Hispanics, 4%. In U.S. Hispanics, which is a mixture of Hispanics, 20%. And when you look at Caucasians or non-Hispanic whites, it's about 40%. So clear different molecular uh, patterns depending on which group you're looking at. 
And this becomes as a molecular basis for differences. Not only is that we might, don't, you know, we might uh, not have access to care, or maybe the penetrance or, or the compliance with screening is lower in Puerto Rico, yes, but maybe there are also different patterns in the molecular biology of the tumors, which may have implications for you know, treatment response, survival, et cetera, et cetera. And we did the same thing. We look at the location of the tumors, and again, you can see that um, most patients that had microsatellite uh, instable, instable, unstable um, tumors had um, the tumors located on the right side of the column. So when we compare the Hispanics from the U.S. with non-Hispanic whites, as I mentioned before, there was a, a statistically significant difference uh, with non-Hispanic white uh, tumors having more microsatellite and unstable tumors. And um, there was also a difference in the um, presence of the protein. And you, know, you might be wondering, so what is the importance of having differences in the molecular basis of colorectal cancer? Well, it is important if the behavior of the tumor is different. So if the patient presents with a tumor at an earlier age because of the molecular changes, if a tumor does not respond to chemotherapy because of the type of uh, molecular um, changes that they have, then it becomes important. And in fact, studies have shown that. Tumors that are microsatellite unstable, they don't respond well to chemotherapy. In fact, when you give them chemotherapy, the, um, li the survival, it's decreased. Furthermore, and more recently, and we have some oncologists here, uh, including Maribel, my friend there, we know that if there is a, a, an activated um, mutation in the KRAS, they will not require, they will not respond to the EGFR, which are, which are antibodies that are important and actually part of the chemotherapy that is given to patients with colon cancer. So that's why having differences at the molecular level are important in trying to identify differences between populations, because they might have implications on screening, treatment, and prognosis. So the next um, few slides, um, I wanted to share just a few, uh, um, well, actually, this is uh, only a pilot data that we performed last year. Um, this was a project um, that was carried out by the Raul Bernabe and um, Cristina uh, Castro, who was completing her master's in biochemistry. And um, she wanted to evaluate um, CPG island methylator phenotype among colorectal cancer patients. And um, as we were discussing previously, this is a distinct epigenotype uh, for colorectal cancer. And uh, we know that tumors that express um, CPG island uh, that have, you know, SIMP high will behave differently. And in fact, uh, when you look at the, uh, at the, did I put it here? Yeah. When you look at the literature, you can see that those SIM positive and SIM high tumors, they have a worse prognosis. They have lower response to chemotherapy. And it's believed that nowadays about 20 to 50% of all tumors will have a CPG island methylation phenotype. And if that's the case, the therapy should be different or may, may, you know, may need to be tailored for this particular group of patients. So there is no data on um, this particular phenotype among colorectal cancers uh, patients that come from Hispanic ethnicity, not from Puerto Rico, not from the U.S. Uh, in fact, we're now part of a consortium to try to evaluate this in Hispanics from the U.S. Uh, so Christina went ahead and um, performed um, methylation-specific PCR, and you can see the method there, and she evaluated 25 um, k tumors from Puerto Rican patients, and um, she evaluated the panel that is, you know, um, available, that you can evaluate these seven specific um, genes to determine whether or not they were methylated, and depending on the genes that are methylated, it's divided between C CIMP, high or low or normal. So, and that's, uh, let me pull. Whoops, sorry. Okay, so this is um, the gel, and you can see here, this is just an example, uh, evaluating P16, and, and, and you can see the uh, methylated, for each one we was either methylated or unmethylated or methylated. But let me show you the results. Okay, so the 25 cases divided in simp high, simp low, or no simp, you can see that most of the cases were simp low. And what has been published in other uh, groups, in um, non-Hispanic groups, actually most um, um, tumors tend to be high. So our high, we only had three tumors that were SIMP high. Most of them were SIMP low. And when you look at the genes that we, we evaluated, P16 was methylated in 56% of the tumors. When you look at the um, Caucasian groups, less than 10% of those tumors will have um, methylation of this particular gene. IGF-2 was another one that was surprisingly high, also again methylated. And this one in particular, the H, MLH1, only one individual or 4% was methylated. 
in the other populations, it's, it's completely different. It's about 50% of them are methylated. So you can see just by looking at 25, of course, you know, the statisticians are going to tell me that, you know, this could be simple, you know, a type 1 error, and it's true. Uh, so, of course, we need to repeat this in a larger cohort to make sure that these observations are actually correct. But if they were to be true, immediately this gives you a set of hypotheses. Uh, we know that tumors that have um, methylation in the P16, they have worse prognosis. So maybe that's why the stage-specific colorectal cancer survival in Puerto Rico is much lower than the one in the U.S. In fact, a stage 2 colorectal cancer um, patient in Puerto Rico has a 60% lifetime, I mean, sorry, five-year survival compared to about 85% in the U.S. So could it be that we're not given the right treatment? Could it be that we're not given the treatment? Or could it be that the molecular bi biology of the tumor is different and it, will and it will require a different set of genes, I mean, a different set of chemotherapy? We don't know. We have to explore that. So our results um, so far, you know, preliminary results, have shown that tumors in Hispanics from Puerto Rico have lower MSI, uh, lower mismatch repair proteins, and also uh, they seem to have lower CPG island methylation phenotype. So there appears to be a difference at the molecular level between the cancers from Puerto Ricans and cancers from other ethnic and racial groups. The last part of my presentation, uh, let me make sure that we're good with time. Yeah, 10 minutes, good. It's um, this um, area that we have expanded our horizons to look into. Uh, so genomic admixture, I know you, we have a presentation before, uh, but I, you know, just very briefly, when you think about Hispanics, right, we know that we are a result of three main um, groups, right, the European, Amerindian, and African individuals. And um, we know that it all started, you know, when the, we were discovered, and, and then we, you know, we had the slaves, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and we know that that degree of admixture varies significantly depending on where the Hispanic uh, individual is coming from. So this particular map, you can see where the different studies have been done. And if you look at the, um, the distribution of which percentage of the genome is Amerindian, Caucasian, or, or African, you can see that it varies dramatically. In fact, as I was mentioning before, if you go to Chile or Argentina, uh, there's a, a lot of um, Amerindian and, um, and European. However, you don't see too much African, but if you come to the Caribbean and here in Puerto Rico, right, and we learn about this it's more earlier today, or you know, any of the Caribbean, you can see that the percentage of, of um, African um, genes increase. And if you look at certain regions like in, you know, Mexico, you can see that there are more Amerindian uh, in, on those places. So the genomic admixture varies significantly. So there have been studies that have looked at Puerto Ricans and Mexicans regarding where the genes are coming from. And you can see, just by looking this, eyeballing this, you can see that among Puerto Ricans, there is a higher percentage of genes that come from Euro European um, ancestry uh, compared to Mexicans. However, there are more a larger percentage of genes that are Amerindian among Mexicans compared to Puerto Ricans. And again, what's the importance of this? Well, it will be important if having those different um, distribution of genes is associated with an increased risk of disease, which is what we're hypothesizing. So we decided uh, to do a case case study and we evaluated um, patients that were Puerto Ricans, and those are actually, these are, yeah, these are colorectal cancer patients, with a group of non-Puerto Rican Hispanics that were collected at the uh, um, University of California in San Diego, uh, that which were part of the colon cancer family registries. And we used standardized AIMS panels, and AIMS stands for Ancestry Informative Marker Panels, which allows you to distinguish uh, where the genes are coming from, a particular individual, up to 99% in this particular group. And we use this preliminary data for a grant that we submitted um, in February, which will be reviewed next week. Uh, so we'll know soon if they like our idea or not. Uh, so we use those 106 um, panels, and, and I mentioned that before. And the correlation is actually very good. And the, pro the program that was used for analysis was structure. Uh, for those in the audience that know about this, so these are this is the this is the distribution of the gene of, of where the genes are coming from. So here are 94 individuals that were all um, colorectal cancer patients, Puerto Ricans, um, collected through the registry that we have, and you can see here that um, the distribution varies even in our group. But you can see that in red is the African um, contribution for our colorectal cancer patients. It was much higher than when you look at the group of individuals that were from Mexico. Most of these patients were from Mexico. So just by looking at this, you can see that uh, the distribution of, of where the genes were coming from, the genomic admixture, was different. Then we look at them, again, you know, compare one to one, and you can see that there were more European genes in our Puerto Ricans, 
Amerind less Amerindians and more African, and that was um, statistically significant in the three groups. But the most important thing was that we were able to demonstrate in this small case case study that having European ancestry was associated with an increased risk of having colorectal cancer. This is an odds ratio, but it was associated with, a, with higher uh, possibility of having colorectal cancer status. And the final um, increased risk was a 32% increase in colorectal cancer risk with every 25% increase in European ancestry. And you can see the numbers there. When we stratified the analysis and we divided, uh, we put the US Hispanics, which most of them were Mexicans, and we separated the Puerto Rican Hispanics, look at what happened. That association between European ancestry and colorectal cancer was only observed among the US Hispanics. So could it be, and you can see the p-values here, so could it be that maybe it's not only, maybe it's not the European, maybe it's the presence of having or not having more African genes that come from America, Africa, we don't know. But you know, this particular um, preliminary data, uh, uh, we, we just recently submitted this, and we need to, again, evaluate this in a, in a larger context, and not only that, we didn't add just for anything this particular thing. So could it be that there are many other things, um, you know, maybe it's more females than males, maybe it's related to um, uh, many other exposures. We only look at, not even age, it's not even adjusted by age. So this was just case, case, genes, and cancer. And you could see that, you know, the associations. So all this data that I've, I've been able to show today here, it's, part, uh, it's in part um, a, a result of the Puerto Rico Familial Colorectal Cancer Registry, which I, I work with, and uh, we've been working on this registry for the last three years. And, and I just wanted to briefly tell you about this. Uh, I'm very grateful to my collaborators from the uh, Puerto Rico Central Cancer Registry, and I saw Mariela so, somewhere, Mariela, who is our collaborator and her group at the, at the Cancer Registry. Uh, we've been doing this for the last three years, now four actually. And um, we have a passive um, consent. So basically when a patient um, gets diagnosed in Puerto Rico with colon cancer, that information gets to the registry. Every month we receive the cases that are, you know, the new cases. We send a letter to the physician. The physician either tells us, you know, to go ahead and contact the patient, or if we have no answer, then we call the physician again. Uh, we usually get a passive consent, and then we send a letter to the patient, and then the patient decides whether or not they want to participate. At the end, you know, we start with 100. You know, if we start with 100, we end up with about 30 to 40 percent response rate when you go through all those echelons. So it's not, you know, it's a, it's a very labor intensive. And my uh, fabulous collaborator, um, Jaritza, uh, it's actually, you know, the soul behind this registry. And I think I saw Jari right there. Uh, she's been working with us and getting all those patients and families, et cetera. And this analysis is a year old. Uh, I didn't do a new analysis for this, but just to show you, at that point we had 75 probands um, and their families. And um, at this point we have over 120. And um, most of those individuals have multiple members in their families with colon cancer. Uh, we collect from the individuals the tissue, uh, blood, um, which, you know, PBL, serum, et cetera. We have also the tumor and um, a lot of epi and nutritional data that we could use to evaluate, you know, changes uh, in the, that we see in the tumors in association with the environment as well. And um, this is, you know, some pictures of our team that uh, go there to different places to recruit patients. Sometimes we have to go to the field and get the blood sample there. Uh, sometimes they, they come on a Sunday, uh, and then we have to persuade the clinical research center to work with us, but they do. And um, so to summarize, um, we have, I've shown you in the last um, 25 minutes that there are ethnically based molecular um, differences in colorectal cancer, and um, there are lower fre frequencies of specific um, uh, changes in the in the pathology, and you can see that there's also a clinical phenotype associated with changes at the molecular level. Uh, I have also shown that at least in this preliminary, very uh, crud, unadjusted um, analysis, that European ancestry appears to be associated with the risk of colorectal cancer, and um, we believe that there are differences that are that may be very important, not only to the development of the disease, but also to the response to the, to the disease. Of course, there's a lot of information that needs to be collected. And in fact, I envision a time that when a patient gets diagnosed with cancer, we could take that tumor, do a panel of genes that are specific for our ethnic group, you know, not for all the other Caucasians, because we know that our tumors are different. And that's, uh, that could be a basis of the disparity that we see in our population. We know already that in African Americans, there's a lot of differences in the genes that get actually uh, turned on and turned off, or methylated or non-methylated, and we know that response to therapy is also different. Unfortunately, at this point, most of the therapy is guided by 
by stage rather than by changes in the, in the uh, gene as per se or the tumor per se. And um, most of the tests that we use even to classify the tumors are not developed or tested within our patients. So there, you know, there's no data on Hispanics. So we're using uh, methods that were developed by, you know, by uh, using tumors from other ethnic or racial groups. So this must be important. So hopefully uh, when they review our score, you know, our grant next week, uh, the score will at least get a review. That's all I want to I have. I want a review to be able to modify it and send it again if we have to. But we we'll never know. We might even get it. So if we do, we'll be able to um, answer some of the questions that we propose here. And I think that's all I have. And that's um, some of my collaborators I, uh, that are working. Uh, the, on the left side are the one from Puerto Rico for these particular projects that I mentioned. And on the other, on the right side are some of the, my collaborators uh, from the U.S. and China. And I think that's all. Thank you. <laughs>